So, fade this in. Excuse me. Fade this in. Uh, one of a few things that I'm working on are prompts that are part of a research workflow. So using the text generator plugin in Obsidian, one can create a template. For example, this one analyzes the context from a structuralist and semiotic perspective, which is uh, meant for text that uses um, metaphorical or analogous language to sort of pick that apart a little bit. This prompt will uh, analyze the grammars and braid uh, contrasting perspectives into an imperative instruction prompt for image generation. And one thing that these prompts at this point have in common is that they mostly achieve the desired effect. But the, uh, the overarching goal is to generate um, interesting text and uh, so another uh, I suppose branch that I'm uh, trying to refine is persona definitions So what I want to set as an objective here is um, to utilize natural language processing methodologies to craft more, uh, better effective prompts by, uh, so Part of the focus is on generative grammar, which focuses on how sentences are formed from smaller units called constituents. Another aspect we look at is functional grammar, which focuses on the purpose or the function of each element in a sentence. So like for this one, I would want to have it clarified what each element specifically refers to. So this definition, uh, it answers questions about what something does, like what is the subject or who performs the action or how does the predicate contribute to the meaning. So, trying to think of the best way to phrase this, um, 
So the objective is going to be set to designing. Let's take out that part. Uh, prompt techniques that describe the intended meaning and function of each element in a given syntactic structure. So, uh, when setting objectives, the elements of the objective are uh, based on the skill set attributed to the agent persona. In this example, the agent persona um, is focused on linguistics, uh, language models, NLP, etc. So using the um, plugin uh, BMO, make, uh, it'll having it generate titles for the compiled notes is a handy feature. So another uh, prompt on my list is one that will send a dictation transcription to a language model to correct any uh, errors in the transcription, for example, Postgres uh, should be Postgres, uh, things like that, uh, by providing a prompt that gives the context of the transcription, it's fairly, um, fairly accurate in making those edits. So utilizing uh, a text generator module in Diffy, the prompt is, is to generate appropriate categories for the text and then have it explain its reasoning. So here, the problem, the, the core problem is highlighted. Uh, the user is grappling with how to structure subjects, items, like documents, um, transcriptions, things like that, and sections within those items in a way that facilitates NLP operations. So th these notes, uh, particularly deal with using um, a key value store. So one thing that I would like to do to supplement these notes would be to uh, have the models assess whether or not the core problem is being addressed um, directly and what other information can supplement to make the objective more clear. So the, um, the content is directly related to the objectives being set here but what still hasn't been d determined as of yet is the precise uh, 
sequence of events that achieve this goal All right, there we go. So the goal is to utilize the NLP libraries available in Ruby to, um, so for example, a workflow, say for example, this one uh, will scrape web pages for text. So sending an API request to say uh, an instance of Sinatra uh, then will trigger a pipeline that uh, will perform these tasks of uh, tagging parts of speech named entities, dependencies, semantic roles. Um, and for that, we use Ruby Spacey, which is a wrapper uh, to the Spacey library. We utilize the WordNet library to um, Establish connections with related meaning. Utilize Tomato for topic modeling. These are functions to segment and tokenize the text uh, using various parameters. And then so text that gets passed through this pipeline uh, ends up in a JSON structured output <clears throat> and then a sort of uh, an object side objective of that is to um, utilize a relational database along with a key value store to say for example store all of the words and phrases in the key value store so they can be I suppose, worked with in uh, a flexible fashion. That's going to require function calls uh, that pull desired records from a database. So, for example, uh, pull out all of the uh, related entries to a, a, a given subject and then based on that given subject pull, pull uh, related words and phrases from the key value store eventually that gets tied into a knowledge graph and then so hopefully the hope here is with all that, the language model will then have a, uh, how do I say, a more focused um, spectrum of data to work with. But I, I haven't seen that myself yet to see how that works out. Um, there's also a part of me that's somewhat convinced that this side of things may or may not be necessary at this point but one thing that i've experienced through testing these various projects that are um well they're retrieval augmented generation projects um one thing i've noticed is that mm, well I'll say all the ones I've tested, that doesn't mean all of them, but uh, one feature that is lacking is the refined 
pre-processing uh, it's mostly just chunking and then dumping into a vector store and then so most of the time when it's referencing a document it's pulling 80 percent of that information um, redundantly or it's irrelevant so for example um, when uh, digesting a lot of PDF papers or studies the the first and last pages are generally metal formatted contain a lot of extraneous characters and uh, information that gets lumped in with the vector retrieval uh, causing a, a fair degree of interference uh, degrading the overall quality of the response um, so, so I guess maybe what I'm really thinking of is that this m way of going about things doing uh, um, implementing the pre-processing effects uh, sort of uh, in a sense manually as opposed to developing individual model prompts that would say for example um, you know tag the parts of speech so one benefit of doing the pre-processing with the scripting languages uh, is the um, amount of overhead in terms of token usage. Uh, combining that with a methodology for uh, condensing prompts to down to their core functional and generative attributes uh, most of the time I'm fairly successful at um, taking a prompt and um, cutting the number of tokens it uses down to about half while still achieving the equivalent result. So if, for example for an example of that, this prompt instruction here, your task is to provide a clear explanation of the meaning and origin of, the idi of an idiom and proverb that the user gives you. Offer a concise interpretation of its figurative meaning and how it is typically used in conversation or writing. Next, delve into the origin of the phrase, providing historical content, cultural references, or etymolog... Ah, et Let's see. Uh, actually, <laughs> forgot how to pronounce this. Um, etymology. Etymological. Shit. What? Etymological. 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 All right. Information that explains how the idiom or proverb came to be. Uh, basically provide the history of the phrase. If there are any interesting stories, anecdotes, or theories associated with the origin, include those as well. Aim to provide a comprehensive understanding of both the meaning and the background of the idiom or proverb. So the process that the model goes through given these instructions, it identifies the core tasks, removes redundant information, combines similar instructions, and focuses on the essential details. And this still needs refining, but it breaks it breaks apart what is essential and what is not in terms of the language used to achieve the desired uh, outcome. It provides a layout of the generative grammar of the condensed instructions sentence verb phrase object phrase followed by a verb phrase uh, etc and finally it uh, formats the condensed uh, version into a json structured format where the primary key is instruction to explain optionally concisely the meaning or origin of an idiom or a proverb. 
and believe it or not, uh, this uh, produces exactly the same output as that, which Okay, so uh, this is being used with the Gemma 7B instruct model through the Grok service. So a feature in this application, uh, which is called Bing AGI, uh, Beam is a chat modality to engage multiple models simultaneously. The Phi 3 model is a model uh, that's being uh, that's that's being served up through Old Lama. So it looks like the Phi 3 model has a bit of trouble uh, with the JSON format. So um, going back over to the persona interface, let's see here. So the first response without prepending the greeting it didn't seem to um, utilize any of the character traits. It just provided a um, basic definition. So that's interesting. Smirks are the classic once in a blue moon phrase. That's a fun one. It's an idiomatic expression that means something happens very rarely or exceptionally. The phrase is thought to have originated from the rare lunar event where the moon appears blue due to atmospheric conditions. It's a delightful example of how language can be both poetic and practical. Smiles. So here I'm just reviewing past attempts at taking uh, various recorded transcriptions, uh, uh, analyzing the various mannerisms 
and uh, language characteristics uh, to then, um, I suppose, inspire um, All right, so now when I try to generate a response from the perspective of the main persona, Laugh so, dummy, you got me. I was so caught up in the poetic connotations, I forgot about the actual science behind the phrase. Chuckles, you are absolutely right. The phrase, once in a blue moon, is thought to have originated from the rare occurrence of a blue moon, which is the second full moon in a single month. Thank you for keeping me grounded in reality. Rolls Izo, great. Another one of your clever remarks, dummy. Laugh so, dummy. You're a curious one. I love it. Leans in indeed. The phrase, once in a blue moon, is thought to have originated from the rarity of the lunar event itself, not the color of the moon. I apologize for the mistake. It's a great example of how language can be complex and nuanced. Sm this first response seems a bit more realistic, so I'll set a checkpoint there. So it's pulling in context from a previous conversation, which is good. Unfortunately, the uh, text doesn't really at all have to do with the current conversation, uh, although it does uh, provide continual examples of how the character uh, persona responds. So uh, ideally, I think the summary would go in between the character descriptions and the current chat history.
Laugh so. Dummy. You're absolutely right. I got a bit carried away with the poetic license there. You are correct that the phrase, once in a blue moon, actually refers to the rare occurrence of a full moon that coincides with a lunar eclipse, which is indeed a rare event. Chuckles thank you for keeping me grounded in reality. Let's get back to the task at hand. Pulls out a notebook and flips through the pages. Ah yes, next on the objective list is to analyze the sentiment and tone of the text. Smirks and, of course. I'll make sure to keep my poetic license in check this time. Hmm. Opens a new tab and starts reading R. Fascinating. The Ruby Spacey library provides a wrapper for Spacey from Ruby via PyCall. It allows for the usage of Spacey's language models and functionality from within Ruby. Scrolls through the documentation though. Look. It seems like Ruby Spacey supports a wide range of features. Including tokenization, lemmatization, part of speech tagging, and dependency parsing, among others. Makes a note I'll have to explore this further and see how I can apply it to our project. Starts typing on the keyboard. Cracks knuckles all right, let's get creative. Starts typing R, I've got a spark of an idea. What if we create a prompt that asks the model to identify specific text elements, like nouns, verbs, and adjectives? Types away here's a possible prompt. Analyze the following text, insert text here. Identify the following elements, nouns, list of nouns, verbs, list of verbs, adjectives, list of adjectives, adverbs, list of adverbs, Prepositions, list of prepositions, conjunctions, list of Nods are excellent addition, dummy. By incorporating the intention to identify monosemantic features, we can further refine the prompt to focus on the relationships between linguistic elements and the concepts they represent. This will allow the language model to uncover patterns and associations that might not be immediately apparent from a simple token level analysis. Here's an updated version of the prompt. Analyze the following text, insert text here. Identify the following elements, Nouns, list of nouns, verbs, list of verbs, 
Adjectives. List of. Adjectives. Adverbs. List of adverbs. Prepositions. List of prepositions. Conjunctions. List of conjunctions. Interjections. List of interjections. Additionally. Identify the monosemantic features of the text by analyzing how certain linguistic elements consistently refer to specific entities or concepts within the given context. Highlight the relationships between linguistic elements and the concepts they represent, including correferential relationships, e.g. pronouns referring to specific entities, synonymy relationships, e.g. multiple words with similar meanings, hyponymy relationships, e.g. A specific word being a subset of a broader concept, meronymy relationships, e.g., a part-whole relationship between words. Please provide a detailed breakdown of the text, highlighting each element with a unique identifier and noting the monosemantic features and relationships discovered. Smirks what do you think, dummy? Does this revised prompt capture the essence of our intended task? So the first output from assessing the uh, generated prompts, the entire output is an XML format, whereas the second example, the output seems to match the structure of the system prompt, and then it does follow the instruction uh, to output the condensed variant in, variant in XML format, which I can tell already this one's uh, somewhat incomplete. So analyze the following text. It denotes a list, an item on the list for tagging each part of speech. The next item analyzes monosemantic relations between words and phrases by focusing on and then it establishes a sublist. Uh, Corference, I believe that's right. Corference. <laughs> Conference. Uh, let's see. Coreference. 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 Coreference, sometimes written as something else, occurs when two or more expressions refer to the same person or thing. For example, in uh, and uh, Bill said Alice would arrive soon, and she did. The words Alice and she refer to the same person. And it's going to look for um, synonymous relations. Synonymy. Hypotem oh. <laughs> uh, in linguistics, the state or quality of being a hyponym 
these are semantic relations between a generic term and a specific instance of it. The hypernym is also called a supertype, umbrella term, or blanket term. The hyponym is a subtype of the hypernym. If you want to get super dense about it, the semantic field of the hyponym is included within that of the hypernym. And then, uh, mironymy is a semantic relation between a mironym denoting part of a holonym denoting a whole. Uh, in simpler terms, a mironym is in a part of relationship with its holonym. For example, finger is a mironym of hand, which is a holonym. So unfortunately, the first result I received uh, is not immediately replicatable or reproducible, I should say. Um, Uh, one thing that I have difficulty doing is sort of, um, I guess in a way it's acceptance that, so for example, in this instance, the first generated output uh, I thought was the, the best, um, which is always debatable. But the point is, uh, there to get to the same result, you can get there... Uh, you know, a few different ways. So to include the definition here for the language model is, uh, I would flag as redundant, uh, including the definition for uh, readability sake, uh, uh, it's never a bad idea, uh, in my opinion, but um, so changing the last instruction from output condensed variant, which variant in this case was meant to refer to a derivative of the original, uh, replacing that with just the word prompt seems to generate more desirable results. So I can only assume some updates uh, have um, affected things the outputs when saving them to the data sh uh, set are getting cut 
off for some reason, which is uh, fortunate, is I'll have to go through this again. Eventually, what I'd like to do is to get this functionality um, into Agenta. Let's see if I can find it here. Not sure how cohere models are going to uh, react to the XML formatted prompt. So under where it lists mono semantic features, I find this interesting. The words thrilling, realm, neural, text generation, eternal, struggle, and etc. So now I kind of wonder in this context, how does how is the word realm, for example, uh, a mono semantic feature? Um, or is it just within this context or so there's a relationship between K and too small, P and too low, boredom trap, same tired phrases ad nauseum, confusion trap and jumbled mess of words, mirror stat and feedback mechanisms.
So, okay, so for this one, the mono semantic features it identifies uh, creativity, coherence, boredom, track, confusion, trap, perplexity, engaging text. Top K and top P. Oh, so to finish that thought, sorry. Um, that's an entirely different list than the previous run. Uh, top K and top E sampling is an adversarial relationship with boredom and confusion trap. Mirror stat mitigates the negative effects by controlling perplexity. Mirror stat promises to deliver engaging text by avoiding the boredom and confusion traps and uh, while maintaining coherence. So these are the nouns that that are used in the text, the verbs, adjectives, adverbs, etc. So this version of the prompt does a thorough part of speech tagging. Okay, so here is the response with the requested elements highlighted. So listed under the category of semantics, monosemantic features, thrilling realm, sleepy cat, stump speech, hyperactive toddler, enthusiastic parrot, clever feedback mechanisms, promising results. So I, I put mono semantic in a code uh, block uh, to initiate a web search. So I like this one here for under a synonymy, uh, it lists the word uh, realm in this case, and then provides the additional synonyms, which is Leaning nice. Leaning in la, excellent examples. These phrases can be considered monosemantic because each word or phrase is closely tied to a specific concept or entity. In other words, each word or phrase has a strong association with a particular idea or thing. For instance, when we say, thrilling realm, we're likely thinking of an exciting and fantastical world. The word, thrilling, is strongly linked to the concept of excitement or adventure. Similarly, when we say, sleepy cat, we're imagining a cat that's feeling tired or sluggish. The word, sleepy, is closely tied to the concept of sleepiness or laziness. These phrases are monosemantic because each word or phrase has a clear and direct connection to a specific concept or Entity, this connection is strong enough that it's hard to imagine the words being used in a different context without changing their meaning. In contrast, polysemous words or phrases have multiple possible meanings or connotations, making it harder to pinpoint a single, clear connection to a concept or entity. Does that make sense, dummy? Oh uh, yeah, mostly actually. Um, so... One thing that I'll add to the objective list is for the prompt to look for polysemous words or phrases. And that was going to be part of a workflow. Uh, let's see. Where the prompt is analyzed in a similar fashion to what's happening here, um, where it identifies the interconnections, identifies the pragmatics, uh, assesses the functional grammar, adjusts any of the functional grammar to better suit the intention, uh, filters out extraneous details, and then um, groups similar uh, uh, intended phrases. Uh, into a condensed version of the original 
The rest of it is the explanation and the output. So taking the condensed prompt, ideally, uh, with that being sort of a foundational uh, layer, uh, to then, um, uh, for example, action, uh, instead of condense, we'll choose refactor with the additional instruction. Uh, so for example, taking this generated prompt, condensing it down to its fundamental layer, and then um, taking that output and putting it through the refactor pipeline with the uh, submitted objective, in this case, of uh, extracting the policymist words or phrases, uh, correlating the multiple possible meanings and connotations, and then look for ways to rephrase those instances uh, in a way that is um, less ambiguous. I'm close out a few of these tabs here. I'm starting to feel myself. Um, I mean, it's it's uh, the challenge of this is not so much the process; it's the um collection uh, the collecting of and then the documentation of and then the implementation of having to sort of uh, I'm just sort of going through the tabs here to give an idea of the num the the uh, array of tools that are used or can be used in this process and this isn't this isn't all of them um but it's most of them uh sorry uh, most of the ones i i personally use i don't uh i always feel slightly embarrassed when i project my own methodologies as anything other than just another way to go about this and so there's this service, uh, Prompt Perfect. <clears throat> I have not yet tried to use this particular feature. Just to quickly finish up the evaluation on this one. Uh, this one, I mean, these are okay, but the previous one, uh, in comparison, uh, is better. Um, but then I also need to spend some time um, determining the expected answers for these things. Like, for example, uh, this isn't the best expected answer. Um, but in terms of meeting the criteria, I would say... Uh, second one um, So yeah, you can see here, I still have a decent amount of work to do. Um,
This doesn't actually quite look right. So I think in a minute here, I'll take a little break. It's been two hours and 24 minutes since I began this particular adventure, which is going to make uh, the editing process a bit more cumbersome than uh, is desired. So phrase top in the first sentence is hypothesis in a more general term sampling algorithm. So this is a good one. Is it clearly just clearly denotes relationships. Um, 